Revelation chapter 17 and 18. All right, now before we dive into these chapters, I want to shoot straight with you. There are a lot of pictures in these chapters. There's a lot of unique stuff going on in these chapters. There's a lot of interpretations that can come out out of these next few chapters. So I'm gonna share some different perspectives with you. I'm gonna share with you what the scripture says, and I may give an opinion or two along the way. Basically, I just wanna share with you what the word of God says, and we will let the chips fall as they may. This is what I say to people. Every single word of God is true. We learn even at the end of Revelation in chapter 22, God says, you know, don't add to this, don't take away from this. Our interpretations might be right, our interpretations might be wrong, but I know this, his word is true. Let's dive into the word, let's unpack it. Chapter 17. It says, possibly in your heading, Babylon, the prostitute of the beast. We're about to see pictures spiritually of the enemy and what the enemy is setting up in this world system the enemy is setting up to oppose God. I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna unpack it. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by the many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. So you have this great prostitute, and it's this is a picture. It's not a literal prostitute. This is a picture of how the enemy tries to get people in the world to violate their relationship with God and to commit adultery with his system, his viewpoints, his lies. Basically trying to pull people away from the truth of God and into his lies. So when it says in verse two that you know they committed adulteries, this isn't as much a sexual act. While there may have been adultery that took place, what it's really referring to spiritually in a greater scope is that the enemy was drawing people away from God and to himself and to two other things. And people were having an adulterous relationship against God. They weren't giving to God what he rightfully deserved. Now, when it talks about the prostitute, we'll learn later in verse five, it's talking about Babylon. Now, Babylon is a, again, a picture. There is much discussion about what this could be. It could be the world system or this global economy or this global power that the Antichrist sets up, or it could be a literal location. It could be the the location of Babylon rebuilt, or it could be a new Babylon. It could be like Rome restored. There is much discussion about what this could possibly mean. Honestly, it could be all of it. It could be a city and it could be a system. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's what the enemy is setting up to oppose God and to try to trip up people that God has called to him. Verse three. We're having a setting change. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. The angel took me from where I was to a different location. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Okay, so we see the beast again. We see this, we see this antichrist, if you will. And it's interesting because it says she's covered with that the beast is covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, was glittering with gold, precious stones, pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. What's interesting about this is that it looks good on the outside. In everything that the enemy does, he tries to dress up and make it look good on the outside, clothed in purple and gold, royal. It looks royal. It looks pure. A golden cup, it looks refined. But what's inside the cup will wreck your life. And it's interesting how you have this pairing, if you will, the woman and the beast, and it's almost as if there's this picture like we learned early in Revelation of how you have this, you know, there's the false prophet who was in tandem with the Antichrist and you have this false religious system that opposes God and then you have this world dictator that opposes God and they worked in tandem. The enemy will use the things of the world as as it benefits his motivation, as it benefits his tactics. And so even things the enemy will allow to operate that might not be his end goal, but he will use them to try to get to his end goal, if that makes sense. It says the name written on her forehead, verse five, was a mystery. Babylon the great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. What does that mean? The woman basically was 
persecuting and massacring God's people, not a literal woman, but this entity, this, this system, this, this viewpoint that opposes God. They were martyring Christians for believing in God. It says, then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? Why are you astonished? John had just mentioned he was greatly astonished. He's like, what about the surprises you? What about what the enemy's up to surprises you? This is what the enemy's always up to. It shouldn't surprise you. He says in verse eight, that the beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. I think the King James might say go to its perdition, um, which will be the ultimate judgment of the Antichrist. Now, I wanna share this with you um, out of my notes so that I make sure I communicate this clearly. This is a perspective that some people have. I'm not saying that I agree with this perspective. I'm gonna be honest with you, I have no idea. Um, I believe that every word that God says is true and there's multiple interpretations that could make sense. At the end of the day, God knows what he's gonna do. It's possible there's an answer none of us have even thought of yet. But in verse eight, when it talks about the beast and how he once was and now is not, and yet will come up again. Some people believe that there may be some type of, I don't wanna say resurrection, but some coming back to life that might take place, that there might be, um, we learned earlier how the one of the heads of the dragon was damaged. Some people believe that, you know, this, this, this beast was assassinated or an attempted assassination, and he makes a miraculous recovery. I wanna say that there are some people that also believe it's possible that maybe, the enemy would bring someone back. That would be the enemy's guy. Some people think maybe, uh, I think Judas is, is some people think that because it says, you know, Jesus talked about him, about the son of perdition. He will go to his own. He betrayed Christ. He was anti-Christ. Some people believe that maybe Judas could potentially come back and be the antichrist, just as we learned earlier for the Lord. There were two witnesses. Many believe will be Elijah and Moses um, who will witness for the Lord. Some people believe it might be one of the kings that will be referred to later, one of the different kings, maybe Nero, one of the wicked kings of Rome. Honestly, who knows? The devil's gonna have his guy and his guy is gonna oppose Jesus. It says that this takes a mind of wisdom in verse nine. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five has fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. It's interesting. There's a lot of interpretation that can come into that context when it talks about the seven kings. Five have fallen. You know, who are they? Some believe, you know, Egypt might have been one of them. Some believe I'm just gonna name off some nations. There was Syria, there was Babylon, there was the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire, and there was the Greeks, and then there was Rome, and there was Nero and the different Caesars. It's very possible that it's referring to specific kingdoms that you learn about throughout the Bible that had oppressed God's people, highly likely. And it says, but when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. So even when this Antichrist comes, his authority, his reign is for a limited period of time. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seventh and is going to his destruction, which is what leads some to believe that one of the seven may come back. It really, at the end of the day, there's gonna be an antichrist. I believe that the church will be raptured and that we'll be in heaven and that won't affect us, but there will be someone wicked who the enemy will be using to try to accomplish his wicked purpose throughout the earth. Verse 12. It says in verse 12, then the 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb. I want you to catch this. These kingdoms will come together and they will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Two significant statements that are made. He is Lord of Lords and he is king of kings. He is not just any king. He is the king. He's not like, you know, you have lords and ladies in the old medieval times. He's not just a, a lord. No, he is the lord. He is the lord of lords, and he is the king of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Called, chosen, and faithful followers. I believe that we are called chosen and faithful to follow after God. Verse 15, then the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and language. There are nations that will follow after the enemy. The beast and the 10 horns you saw will hate the prostitute 
They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over the beast, their royal authority, until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Oh, how interesting. The beast and his minions will hate the prostitute, but for a period of time, they will use the prostitute. So there are some things that the enemy hates, but he will put up with it and use it so that he can accomplish his purpose. But then when he's done with it, he will turn. Evil will always turn on evil. It will consume itself. They will consume each other. And it's interesting. It says, for God has put it in their hearts to do this, to accomplish his purpose. It reminds me of Romans 8, where it says, for God works all things together for the good, for them that love God and are called according to his purpose. God will allow evil to consume evil to accomplish his good purpose and to accomplish his perfect will. And it says that that this word of God will be fulfilled. It's been spoken. It's, it's been predestined. It's, it's been preordained by God. It is going to happen. Now, this is the spiritual picture that is painted for us regarding Babylon. Now, we dive into chapter 18. I want to continue, hit both chapters at the same time. I just want to be quick. Chapter 18 is, is really the same picture, but from the world's perspective. It's very interesting how it, it kind of like, you're looking at two sides of the same card, I want to say is maybe the saying, and you dive into it from an economic perspective. We'll dive into verse one. It says, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted. It's it's very possible some believe this is a picture of Jesus because of the phrase, two phrases. It talks about an angel, but it says that there's a mighty voice as well as it illuminated the earth by his splendor. So it's very possible that he was carrying a light that God gave him or it was Jesus. And this is a picture of Jesus declaring something. Either way, it doesn't make a difference. The declaration is what's significant in this moment. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It's final, it's decided. God said it twice, we need to pay attention. She's become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. All the other nations have bought into what she is giving away and what she is selling. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, matter for my people so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues for her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes give back to her as she has given pay her back double for what she has done pay her a double portion from her own cup it's interesting at the time of luxury the time of excess the time of adultery is over the Bible is beginning to declare that judgment will take place be not deceived God will not be mocked for whatever a man sows he will reap God says that they will receive a double portion for what they have done it says in verse 7 give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself in her heart she boasts I sit enthroned as queen I am not a widow I will never mourn Therefore, in one day, plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. It's interesting. It talks about how all this in the, later in verse 17, it'll talk about how all this takes place in one hour. It, the fall of the enemy, the fall of Babylon will be great. You've seen economics collapses. You've seen world shut down in pandemic. I'm telling you, you've never seen anything like this. The Bible says when it's time, it's going to just collapse. The things of the enemy can look good for a season. But if you've seen in, in our lives, if we've had seasons where we've just fallen really into sin and we've fallen away from God, it can look good, it can look good, it can look good, and then it just collapses all at once. There will be a great collapse. Verse 9, when the kings of the earth have committed adultery with her and shared her luxury, see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry. Everyone will distance themselves and will weep. This economic collapse will be great. 11, verse 11 through 16 talks about it, and I'll just read through it. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Business will dry up. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, and purple silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, f flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, carriages, and human beings sold to slaves. Basically, this will be a mecca of wealth and a mecca 
mecca of abuse. There will be people who, there will be slavery will somehow be reinstituted. People will be slaves. There, there will be wickedness that is taking place. It's very possible that people who serve the Lord could find themselves in bondage. It will collapse and dry up. They will say, verse 14, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. A reference to Revelation 17, letting us know that this is a similar picture, different perspective. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by the ship, the sailors and all who are in their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. The Bible says, rejoice over her, you heavens. There will be great weeping on the earth. There will be great collapse on the earth, but the Bible says it begins to segue in verse 20. It begins to share heaven's perspective. Rejoice, O you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. The chapter finishes out with a few verses in 21 through 24. It talks about how Babylon is finished and it will not recover. Your heading might say the finality of Babylon's doom. We'll read it. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of a bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people, but your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. Babylon has fallen. Babylon is done. Be blessed today.